welcome to this panel entitled Platform Regulation. My name is Tuomas Ojanen, I'm the chair of the panel. I'm professor of constitutional law at the University of Helsinki, which is also organizing this panel. Uh, with my panel co-organizer, assistant professor Biljana Petkova over there, it's our pleasure to reintroduce the speakers today. As you can see, we are having an impressive lineup, both in a quantitative and qualitative sense. We will start with Jennifer Dascal, who is an associate professor of law at the American University Washington College of Law. Next speaker will be associate professor Sophie stalla Bourdieu from the University of Southampton. The third speaker will be Associate Professor Florent Thauvin over there, who is uh, from the Center for Information Technology, Society and Law in Zurich. Next, fourth speaker will be Kamela G, who is completing his PhD thesis in Paris at the moment. And then Stephen Brill, who is over here, an American journalist. And last but not least, Carmen Turk over there, who has, among other things, litigated cases on platform regulation at the European Court of Human Rights. Before, I, before we start, I will give briefly floor to Biliano to say a few words about the panel. Please, Biliano. Hi, everyone. Um, so we have a great um, lineup of speakers and very little time, so um, I'll keep this intro short. Um, so the idea of the panel is to analyze um, attempts for online platform regulation from a variety of angles. Uh, we start from intermediary liability. Um, Jen is going to give us a bit of background on uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act in the US and talk about recent uh, related developments. Then we'll hear about Section 230's European uh, counterpart, the e-commerce directive uh, from Sophie. Um, next, um, we are going to hear about intermediary liability in the absence of e-commerce in a non-EU um, European country in the Swiss context, and that's um, from Florent. Um, in the second part of the panel, we'll look into recent uh, EU Council of Europe and member state uh, initiatives to fight online disinformation that have triggered new business models. And here we're very happy um, to have Stephen Brill, who has a tangible presence in the American uh, media landscape, um, give a short talk, uh, followed by um, then the presentation of Kamel, who is going to talk about the French um, experience uh, with the Legislative uh, Disinformation uh, Act. And then uh, last but not least, um, I'll hand uh, to um, Carmen to talk about the Council of Europe developments again on this information. Um, all right, so without further ado, um, I'll give the floor to Jen. Thank you, and thank you for, for inviting me to participate in this really um, interesting and important panel. So I want to do, um, I'm really honored to be here, but I want to, I know I have a very brief amount of time, so I want to do three things. I'll at least get to the first two and hopefully to the third as well, to describe the U.S. approach to intermediary liability, to talk about some of the conflicts that are arising across borders, and then hopefully if there's time to talk about some of the nascent efforts in the United States to regulate disinformation under U.S. law. Um, so um, there's two interesting aspects of U.S. law that deal with the intermediary liability. The first is the Communications Decency Act, really Section 230 of that act, and then also, of course, the First Amendment. Um, so just a little bit of background on Section 230. Um, it was enacted in 1996, and it protects, as you can see, interactive computer services, which is defined to include social media sites, search engines, blogging platforms, and, and equivalent type platforms from being treated as a publisher under international, under, sorry, under U.S. law. Um, and this protects these services from being held from civil liability for curating content. Content. Now, the history of this act is often 
forgotten in a lot of the discussion. It was enacted in response to a case in which a provider, a, a bulletin board, was filtering profanity and was subsequently held liable in an unrelated defamation case. The provider argued that it was not its responsibility to filter the site for allegedly defamatory content and said, but the court said that the fact that the bulletin board was separately filtering the site for profanity meant it could filter the site for defamatory conduct, content as well and had a responsibility to do so. So Section 230 was actually enacted as a means of encouraging providers to take down what was deemed undesirable conduct, content without unintentionally exposing them to liability for doing so. Now, over time, 230 has been interpreted with a First Amendment overlay, and it's been described by courts, and this phrase has been repeated over and over, as protecting unfettered speech on the internet. And it's now regularly relied on to protect providers from failure to take down content, including um, porn claims where there, was, there were allegations that providers should have done more to take down pornography or terrorist conduct or address bullying online. Now, there have been some recent um, chinks, the, really the first chink in Section 230, which was a piece of legislation that was enacted in April of 2018. Um, the Allow States to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. And this now carves out from 230 sites that intentionally promote or facilitate the prostitution of another person from, the, from CDA's protections. Um, and this limited change, um, it's limited, but it was highly, highly controversial. It remains controversial. It was argued by many that it chills um, those who support um, a range of speech that ought to be protected speech, including those who want to curate contact to help sex workers, to provide them treatment. Um, um, and there was a recent challenge to the law as being overbroad. It was rejected, at least in the district court, on standing grounds, on the grounds that the particular plaintiffs who brought the case could not actually establish injury. Um, but again, this shows um, the, this is the first um, time since 1996 that there's been any legislative effort to amend 230 to allow for any sort of civil liability um, with respect to the providers. Um, and, and, um, and you can see how robust this is in, in US law and, um, and what a kind of stable it is of US thinking about intermediary liability. Um, meanwhile, um, the First Amendment, as everyone here knows, incorporates a much more robust conception of free speech than in Europe or really anywhere else in the world. And the First Amendment prohibits, with very few exceptions, the US government from telling social media companies, platforms, et cetera, what can and cannot be published online. So the result is a real delegation of authority to pri private actors that are immune from direct governmental regulation, although they are at times and often continue to be subject to indirect governmental pressure, and they're also protected from liability whether they err on the side of excessive takedowns or err on the side of excessive permissiveness as to what's allowed. And of course, what's excessive is in the eye of the beholder. Now, we're starting to see um, some fairly um, broad, um, uh, high-profile cross-border clashes. And there's really two um, key cases where this is, there's more than two, but the two key cases where this is really coming to the fore. Um, in, before the European Court of Justice right now is a case involving the right to be forgotten. Um, and the question before that, the court right now, is whether or not the right to be forgotten um, applies on a global scale or a more localized scale. So the French um, Data Protection Agent Authority is arguing that um, when there is a claim a, a right to be forgotten, that Google or any other search engine has an obligation to de-link the allegedly uh, offending material from all of its domains, from all of its um, from the search engine all, all around the world, um, both not just whether it's accessible in Europe, but whether it's accessible anywhere. 
Um, this case, as I said, is now pending before um, the European Court of Justice, um, but I think you could be fairly assured that if European Court of Justice rules in favor of the French um, DPA, that um, Google will most likely then take the case to a U.S. court and raise a question as to whether or not this creates a conflict with U.S. law and seek some sort of injunction from enforcing that order in U.S. courts. And in fact, we've already seen exactly that in another um, similar analogous case out of Canada. This is called Google v. Equistec. And in this case, Google was ordered to delist, um, de-link de the websites of a company that was alleged to have engaged in trade secret violations and um, was ordered to do so on a global scale. Google objected. Google wanted to do so only um, if the particular website was accessed from within Canada. Um, and the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, you have to do so across the globe. Google then went to a US court and got an injunction preventing Google from enforcing this, uh, preventing a US court from enforcing this order against Google on the grounds that the Canadian order restricts activity that Section 230 protects and undermines the, quote, core First Amendment principles under US law. Um, I have a lot more to say. I did want to get to a discussion of some efforts to regulate disinformation um, under US law, but I will save that for the questions and answers because I am out of time. So thanks. Great. Many thanks, Jen, for uh, setting up the stage for um, also a comparative angle. Uh, now we'll hear about the European regime on intermediary liability from Sophie. Um, so I'll try to be uh, short and sweet. Um, I thought I would first start with expressing some emotions, uh, frustration in particular. Uh, why? because yeah, I, I do love the e-commerce directive and unfortunately not everyone share this love. Um, the directive, the e-commerce directive is that one that is you see on the board. It's an old piece of legislation and therefore some think that it should go to the bin. Uh, why all these emotions? Because in recital, I'm going to give you an extract of, of the directive. In recital 46, it says the removal or disabling of, of access has to be undertaken in the observance or the principle of freedom of expression and of procedures. Um, therefore, there is an acknowledgement of the importance of protecting fundamental rights. Um, some might say, well, this is not binding, um, but Directives are political compromise, so you should be looking at everything to make sense of it, yes? And plus, we've got Article 15, which says member states should not impose a general obligation on providers when providing services covered by Article 12, 13, and 14 to monitor the information which they transmit or store, nor a general obligation to actively seek facts or circumstances indicating illegal activity. Uh, so this is a key safeguard for fundamental rights, yes, and we even have case law that makes sense on that matter, just to uh, mention one, Saban versus Netlog. Um, so when some say Article 15 were there to subsidize the internet giant tech companies, this is not the rational that we should be adopting. Um, Article 15 is here to make sure we don't have surveillance and censorship, and that should be, as I said, the rational under EU law. Um, and the CG, uh, EU does not seem to like surveillance as well, uh, if I mention Shrem, so I'll tell you too. Uh, with this said, why do we want to get rid of Article 15, therefore? Because it seems to be the trend at the EU level, um, on top of shrinking Article 14, by the way. Uh, here I'm asking the question to the policymaker, or lobbyist, depending on uh, where we stand. Um, so Article 15, I'm just going to give a short overview, is, is getting bombed, yeah? Um, some bombs are softer than others. Um, the communication on tackling illegal content online, for example. This is guidance produced by the European Commission, um, which uh, aims at enhancing responsibility for online platforms. Uh, being, what you find in it is, is, seems like this, uh, being proactive does not mean being active, 
And all platforms should be proactive. Yeah? That might seem a bit confusing to some. Um, we've got also the recommendation on measures to effectively tackle legal content online, which again uh, might create some confusion. Um, some bombs are harder if uh, Article 15 uh, was able to speak, this is what it would say. Um, for example, the proposal for a copyright directive in the digital single market, or the proposal for a regulation on online terrorism content. Why this war? Because some say that's the G, I'm, I'm using the G word here, are doing stuff that are not super cool. Um, by the G word, I'm thinking the GAFA, yeah? Um, although I mean, when you use the GAFA now, it's almost like swearing. Um, so they should be regulated. That's the idea behind it. Uh, but, and that's a big but, and it should be even bigger. Uh, we can regulate the GAFA and others without getting rid of Article 15. Yeah? And the proof is the GDPR. <laughs> Fascinating, and also within the time limit. Um, great, so now I uh, hand over to Flora. Well, thank you very much, uh, Biliana. Thank you very much for this brilliant talk. Um, I'm facing a difficult task now um, to match you know, the standard that has just been uh, set. First of all, of course, as always, many thanks to the organizing committee, um, namely to Biliana and Thomas for having me. Um, when we discussed earlier on what I should focus on, we quickly agreed um, that it could be interesting to have a quick look at the situation in a country which is um, at the same time very European and not European at all, namely Switzerland. This seems to be especially interesting because there is no specific regulation for platforms in Switzerland, neither with, res with respect to defining liability for injunctive relief and or damages, nor with the intention to actually create safe harbors. Now you may think, um, or if you should be hungry, uh, even hope that my, could, uh, my talk could actually end here. Um, but of course, even without the regulation, Switzerland has to face the same questions as real European countries and other countries around the world. So in Switzerland, the situation for some time was relatively clear. It was generally accepted for quite some time that the safe harbor principles of the e-commerce directive would also be applied in Switzerland, namely with regard to hosting providers. There were several PhD theses and quite a few scientific papers that were published on the topic. They had somewhat obviously differing views, but almost everybody was in favor of generally applying the regime of the e-commerce directive. In addition, there was a group of Swiss hosting providers that established a code of conduct hosting, uh, which is similar to the e-commerce directive to a wide extent, namely this piece of self-regulation stated or still states that hosting providers have no obligation to uh, monitor the content they are hosting and it also establishes a notice and notice and a notice and takedown procedure. So for quite some time, everything seemed to be okay in Switzerland. Some people still advocated for introducing specific rules for platforms, but there was no political pressure to do so at all. This somewhat cozy situation uh, lasted until January 2013 when the Federal Supreme Court rendered a decision that came as a, uh, as a surprise to many and even as a shock, maybe a bomb, uh, to a few. In that somewhat infamous Tribune de Genève case, the Federal Supreme Court had to decide whether this newspaper from Geneva was responsible for the content of blogs they hosted on their website. One of the blogger that used the service of Tribune de Genève had posted defamatory statements on his blog. Tribune de Genève was sued for injunction by the person that was addressed in this statement, but the claimant had not, as would usually be the case, contacted Tribune de Genève before filing the lawsuit. So there was no notice and no actual uh, knowledge of Tribune de Genève with regard to um, that uh, potentially illegal content. Tribune de Genève had to take down, by way of court order, the content, and they had also to bear the court costs. To be clear, there was no claims for damages, at least, at least not um, uh, in front of the Federal Supreme Court. So um, the issue was all about whether they had to take down the content, yes or no, and whether they had to bear the court costs of a few thousand Swiss francs because they did nothing to prevent um, the illegal content from being hosted on their, on their blog. 
Surprisingly, the Federal Supreme Court did not apply the safe harbors of the e-commerce directive, but the very strict rules for participatory infringement of Article 28 of the Swiss Civil Code, which is the general provision that deems uh, with the protection of personality right. This provision states very clearly that anyone who participates in a violation of personality rights can be sued for injunctive relief, even, for example, a person that is just selling newspapers that contain uh, an illegal content. The Federal Supreme Court made it quite clear in uh, its decision that the court was not entirely satisfied with its decision, but the court said that the legislator would have to get active to remedy this uh, somewhat awkward situation. However, uh, the legislature did not get active. Instead, the government provided a quite comprehensive report on the civil liability of uh, internet service providers uh, just about two and a half years later. And in that report, the government came to the conclusion that a, a regulation was not needed. Rather, um, the government stated that course, courts would actually have the necessary legislative tools and the discretion to come to satisfying conclusions. Basically, the government just returned the ball um, to the camp uh, of the courts. This situation was then remedied, or at least mitigated, by way of another judgment of the Federal Supreme Court that was rendered a few years later. This decision, however, was not about platform liability, but it contains language that can be applied to platforms as well. Namely, the court made it clear that even with regards to the violation of personality rights, there is no liability for the conduct of a third party. Therefore, in case of an omission, such as not taking down infringing content from a platform, an individual or even a legal entity could only be held responsible for a violation of personality rights if he or she actually had a duty to act. This decision has obviously relaxed the situation of hosting providers to a fair extent. Although we have learned that the Federal Supreme Court sometimes likes to surprise the common people, it seems to be relatively sure that the court would not deviate from the generally accepted assumption that hosting providers have no duty to monitor content and to look for potential infringements. So what is regulated in Article 15 of the e-commerce directive. Therefore, um, hosting providers have no duty to act and cannot be held responsible if they have, to, uh, have no actual knowledge of infringing content. But a duty to act could be construed in case of actual knowledge, namely in case of notice, and request of the right owner to delete infringing content. This is especially true for hosting providers that are subject to the code of conduct hosting, in which they actually accept themselves being subject to a notice and takedown procedure, thereby quite explicitly acknowledging a duty to act. So basically, even without having some sort of regulation and after a few uh, deviations, we are back to square one and probably have in Switzerland a situation which is quite similar to that in the uh, European Union. Uh, in, in the European Union. Uh, but we had to face a few you know, difficult moments, uh, but courts have been able to deal with the situation just by actually applying general uh, principles of the law when they had to um, uh, decide specific cases. Great, many thanks, Florent. Um, so we have uh, now um, heard about intermediary liability both in the US and the European context, and now we move to another topic um, which has recently caught the attention of the regulators, namely disinformation. And here um, I'll um, give the floor to Stephen Brill, who is doing important work on, on that front. Is, is there a controller for that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So um, we're going to change the subject only slightly because what NewsGuard is doing has everything to do with what we've been talking about. Uh, the first slide up there is a quote from uh, the definition of our mission, it is also coincidentally a quote from uh, the Code of Practice on uh, Disinformation. And what uh, NewsGuard is all about is doing exactly that. And the way we do it is uh, by using journalists to, what did I just do here? Uh, by using journalists to read and review, um, in the case of the United States, the 2,000 websites, uh, the 2,200 websites responsible for 96% of all the news and information consumed online. We do not use artificial intelligence. We use human intelligence in the form of trained uh, journalists. Um, some 
uh, with two or three years experience, most with much more experience. Um, they team up, they look at a site, uh, they ask around, they do what's called reporting about the site. Uh, they do something that an algorithm does not do, which is they call for comment. If they say anything negative about any site, we have nine very specific criteria that you can see there. Um, if any of those boxes gets an X, even if the overall rating is a green, uh, we call for comment. If a site complains about anything we've done, and some have, um, after the fact, we listen to them, we talk to them, we're the opposite of an algorithm. We are totally transparent, we are human intelligence, you, you know who to call if you have a complaint, and most of all, you actually know what your rating is. And there isn't a single media company on the planet that actually knows how Facebook or Google or Twitter has rated their uh, reliability. So that is um, our mantra, which is that kind of transparency and accountability. Now, the result of that is that we don't believe that uh, this ought to be regulated. We don't think that uh, the platforms ought to have secret algorithms that are suppressing speech. We don't think the government should be suppressing speech. We do think the appropriate regulation is the kind of regulation that the EU has promulgated, which is that the platforms ought to be responsible for providing their users with information that they can use to make their own assessments about what they want to believe and what they don't want to believe. What we do is nothing more and nothing less than provide that information in a completely transparent way. We use our nine criteria. Our nutrition label explains how we arrived at our decisions for each of those criteria. In now over 500 cases of the 2,200 sites we rated in the United States, these sites themselves have actually looked at our criteria and changed some of what they do so that they get a green check instead of a red X. And that to us is why we started the company. Um, unlike an algorithm, we want people to game our system. We want them to look at our criteria and say, um, if we had a corrections policy or if we stopped publishing deceptive headlines, we could get a higher NewsGuard score. Now, of course, there are lots of websites that aren't going to worry about our score. RT and Sputnik are not likely to turn over a new leaf. But what will happen is uh, that when people see those red uh, ratings, they will be less likely to share. Why do I know that? Because we just, uh, we just uh, completed uh, with uh, the Gallup organization, um, and they worked independently, a a study of people who have downloaded our browser plugin, which you can get at newstech.com. Uh, um, and what they found was that people who are using our plugin are much less likely to share the content if it has a red uh, mark on it and much more likely to share it if it has a green. So our goal, again, is not to have the government regulate, but to have the government push the platforms to provide information, not just from us, but if we have a competitor or three competitors, they should license all of them. Our business model is that the platforms will license our data and our ratings so that you don't have to download a free browser plugin. That's the only way it can be available um, on mobile, for example, on an app, and um, our goal is to have them license us, but if we have two or three or five competitors, they can well afford to license all of us and then let people decide which of us is the most, uh, uh, the most reliable, which of us has the best process, because they can see our process uh, completely. So as that slide indicates, everything about us is the opposite of an algorithm. Everything about us is meant to use human intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. And I'll close just by saying, I am not describing to you something that is hypothetical. This is on the ground, it is being used, it is being used 
by people in thousands of libraries where the librarians in the United States have downloaded the plugin. We've had uh, tens of thousands of people in the US that download the plugin. And uh, the reason that I'm here this week is we have announced that we are launching in Europe in time for the EU elections. We will have uh, ratings in the native language using uh, uh, local journalists for each country for Germany, Italy, France, and uh, the UK in April. And we will cover 90 plus percent in each of those countries of all the news and information that is shared online with the same transparency and the same accountability and the same unflinching application of those nine criteria regardless of the politics of the site. So uh, we're glad to be here to talk about this and to provide, I think, a slightly different perspective uh, than one that is simply a debate over what should the government do to regulate content. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, I think it's fascinating, and I've been myself involved in the, in the EU Code of Practice enactment, so it's um, good to hear that new business models are emerging around that. Um, now we'll hear about different types of tackling disinformation um, with two other case studies, uh, one about France, and I'll um, hand over here to uh, Kamel Aji. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Bill, Yana, and Thomas for having me on the panel. Uh, I would like to give you a brief overview of the French response to the spread of fake news online. Um, so how did it start? What, is, what does the statute say? What are the legal and constitutional arguments? And uh, what can we uh, do about it? So uh, during the 2017 presidential election in France, Emmanuel Macron, well, then a candidate, as well as other ones, uh, were the victims of fake news spread on social media, especially Facebook and Twitter. And as soon as he got elected, Emmanuel Macron multiplied statements uh, saying, showing his willingness to uh, take action on fake news. On January 3rd, 2018, during his vows to, to the press, he announced a, a bill to tackle fake news online. And he said something that I find, that I find very meaningful that, that should synthesize the substance and the spirit of, of the, the statute. Uh, he said that all speech is not worth equal. Um, and by that he meant that we need to prioritize or uh, create a hierarchy between those who are spreading information online. So what does the statute say? Uh, the statute creates an emergency procedure for victims of false information, whether uh, candidates, political parties, or any interested party. This procedure is applicable only during the, the, the election periods, meaning about three months before the vote. Um, in order to, to this procedure to succeed, um, four cumulative criteria must be met. The information must be manifestly erroneous. It must gravely undermine the sincerity of the vote. It must be diffused deliberately and in bad faith. And finally, it must be spread through automated or artificial and massive means. A single judge will then have 48 hours to uh, determine whether or not the content should be taken down. The study also creates new duties on online platforms. First one is a duty to inform the public about um, the, the actions undertaken to uh, tackle, to fight against uh, fake accounts, uh, accounts that spread the user's data. Um, they need to provide information about the, the, their algorithms. They need to promote uh, content of third parties to avoid echo chambers um, and filter bubbles. Uh, and they need also to, to give information about the, the HQ and the, the purpose of legal persons who are paying to promote um, informational content online, uh, in, informa information about a public interest debate. They also need to facilitate the reporting or the signaling of false, of false information by users. So, oh, should step back. The study also uh, grants new power to the media regulator, the Superior Audiovisual Council, the SAC, uh, which can now um, request information about the implementation of the statute by online platforms. So whether this means on-site investigation, access to algorithms or database, databases, or to internal or external audits uh, is unclear. Uh, online platforms must report annually to the media regulator the details about the implementation of the above-mentioned measures and the SAC can issue recommendations that are not non-binding. Um, this procedure contributes to, to tech companies' efforts to restore the trust, the relationship of trust with their users, 
uh, because of the reports, then we'll play as evidence of good faith. Um, so um, in France, when, when um, statutes, when, when uh, bills are adopted by parliament, members of parliament can seize the constitutional council to check the constitutionality of the, of the bill before it, it comes into effect. And here, um, multiple uh, legal and constitutional arguments were made uh, to convince the constitutional council that this was not a good idea. The first one was um, about the violation of freedom of expression for two reasons. The first one is because of an unclear definition of the concept of false information or manipulation of information. Uh, there's a high risk uh, of censorship of um, information that is manipulative but accurate, that is inaccurate but not manipulative, or whose effect on, on the sincerity of the vote is unclear. Um, the other expression that is uh, problematic is the one that says uh, the, the alteration of the sincerity of the vote. This is purely speculative according to some members of parliament and it creates a risk of arbitrary decisions um, by judges because they don't have any clue of what this means and how to measure it. It also violates, it would also violate uh, the freedom of expression because during electoral campaigns, speech is particularly protected and we have case law to, to, to prove this. Um, um, this statute is unnecessary, uh, mostly because we already have um, a bunch of um, legal remedies that, are, that remain unused. The 1881 uh, Freedom of the Press Act, for example, the Criminal Code, the Electoral Code contains um, diverse, um, several provisions to tackle misinformation, um, 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 hidden montage of sounds and images. Um, some members of parliament even um, argued that uh, the legislator was um, negatively incompetent uh, because they did not precise the nature of the measures that judges can, can uh, enjoin platforms to take to end the diffusion of false information. So the takedown injunction, we don't know what it, what it could say. It could, say uh, uh, it could contain delinking, delisting, or geo-blocking measures, but we don't know precisely what it should be. Um, and also in practice, um, several members of parliament were concerned about the, the, the deadline that judges have to, to come to a decision. For eight hours, it's practically impossible to, uh, to show objectively that the content is false and manipulative in, in 48 hours. So what, does the, what did the Constitutional Council said on uh, December 20? It held mostly that the, the Constitutional, uh, the, the, sorry, it held that the, the statute is constitutional and that it helps to clarify the electoral debate. So regarding the definition of fake or false information and the alleged violation of freedom of expression, um, the council said that the word allegations does not cover uh, opinions, satire, partial inaccuracy or exaggerations, but only designate those for which it is possible to prove falsity objectively. Uh, regarding transparency obligations on platforms, the council, the council uh, ruled that it only apply, they, these obligations only apply three months before the vote and only uh, regarding the information related to uh, the, the electoral campaign. The council also said that uh, these measures aim at providing citizens with a sense of the value and extent of information during campaigns. To just help people make a better decision and to clarify the, the landscape. Um, so I have a few uh, recommendations, uh, but I will keep these, keep these for the Q&A. Great, we can um, definitely discuss that more in the debate. Uh, many thanks for this comprehensive overview, and now I'll hand it over to uh, Carmen. Um, hello. So I tried to use this five minutes uh, to somehow conclude all the interventions that have been made, because there are two different uh, subjects here. One is intermediaries, liability, limitations thereof, and the other one is disinformation, misinformation, or malinformation, however we call it. However, in the end, these two notions are so unbreakable, intertwingled, that they cannot be separated anymore. So you, whenever you think of misinformation, or malinformation, or disinformation online, there is always an intermediary that we also have to take into account as all the interventions are actually uh, brought out. So, as, as Sophie said uh, before, it was in 2000 when the e-commerce directive was uh, accomplished and it was seen as a big accomplishment, a big way forward. So what happened within the last many years so that in the end, uh, as you remember from the slides, a big red heart that disappeared. So the, 
there is no love lost for many organizations and, and people regards to e-commerce directive. So, so what happened that we have decided that this is not a way forward anymore? So a lot has happened. Uh, the internet is not what it was uh, in 2000. So we tend to need a quick response, as we heard from the last intervention, especially regarding, for example, election time. We need a quicker responses than we are able to achieve via traditional means. Uh, but there are other reasons. The amount of data. With every uh, next year, we create more data than the humanity has created within the whole the history before. So there is this paradigm of how to, how to actually tackle these issues. Uh, and the information we have online, yes, we have a lot of positive, valuable, important information. We also have cat pictures and dog pictures, but we also have this unlawful, undesired information, whether it is a shocking, offending content that goes viral and there is no state in the world, no jurisdiction that would be able to handle it anymore just as we heard also from the last one, that well, the judges were not given means of what to do with, the, uh, with this content, whether to use geo-blocking measures or whether to filter it. So what to do? What are the tools and mechanisms the uh, jurisprudence or the, or the judges are given? Uh, when we are talking about terrorism and radicalization, uh, it goes into hiding in the plain open internet. So it is hard to find by law enforcement. Uh, we have hate speech, which has not uh, gone less, it has not been lessening, but it is increasing with every single day. Uh, and it is affecting our youth, it, uh, it is affecting our elderly people, and it is affecting the whole societies. Now the misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, this is an, an important concept as well. Uh, because years ago we still talked a lot about fake news and fake information, which was very misguiding because fake is always in the eyes of the beholder. So the Council of Europe has, in recent years, tried to somehow categorize uh, this information, trying to put them in some kind of typology. typology. Uh, so how the Council of Europe is saying is, is, well, there is a misinformation which is just false, but it is not with an aim to harm anybody. Then there is disinformation which has an aim to harm, and then there is a malinformation, mainly about information that should have been kept private but was published with the aim to harm again. So what are the responses that we are seeing around regards to this kind of information that it is harmful in our society? So some states are taking it on their, in their own hands. They use different firewalls, uh, kind of in the physical uh, borders of the, of the nation, but uh, they, most of the countries in the world are trying to find the middleman. They are trying to find an intermediary that will tackle this problem on behalf of them. Uh, let's, uh, starting from what Sophie was also referring from the I think the Commission, European Commission, has been most active in this field starting from 2016 with the communication that would ask platforms to uh, have, be responsible in their behavior. Um, 2017 communication that mandates prevention of reappearance of information that in technical terms is rather difficult to achieve. And in 2018 we have another communication However, so what should be the responses if it's not those communications and code of conduct that are hard to follow for all the stakeholders uh, in the market? So the Council of Europe report on the information disorder tries to line out that, well, there are possibilities in, from the technological aspect. You can use flagging, credibility, blacklisting. We also hear, heard one possibility here in the panel today. Uh, the other possibility is stronger media. However, there are doubts that whether really arguing against false information really works in, in nowadays, and then probably it is very hard to argue against all this uh, mis- and disinformation. Uh, the last but not least is the regulation and education. Within the national states, we have seen some normative approaches, uh, notably from Germany. Uh, we have a lot of critiques around the uh, approach. However, it is a normative approach. We have also have some, as we heard, in, in France. 
Uh, the Council of Europe has tried to tackle it from the other uh, from the other angle, trying to look over or reanalyze the incentives and liabilities for intermediaries to try to see that there are different duties and different responsibilities, but these are parallel. It's not only for the states to act, but also intermediaries. And to conclude this, uh, regarding misinformation, disinformation, I really like what the Council of Europe uh, has said in the, uh, from the words of Jan Kleissen that, well, we tend to have in our recent years this freedom of expression, but, and this approach, freedom of expression, but fake news or disinformation, misinformation, does raise a lot of red flags uh, for the future as well. So with this, I would conclude. Thank you very much. Um, so for this high level uh, overview of the Council of Europe. So to what um, extent are platforms regulated? Should there be regulation? And if so, of which kind? Uh, before I open up for Q&A, I just want to say that Thomas and I are working on an edited volume on the topic with several of our speakers uh, today as contributors. Uh, so the book is coming out in the fall with um, uh, Edward Elgar. Working title is Fundamental Rights Protection Online, the Future Regulation of Intermediaries. There we have a more, um, also more than uh, the 10 minute uh, um, contribution. So this is tackled in more detail um, if you wanted to have a look. Um, so I wanted to get us started with a few questions for the panelists and I know Steve needs to um, leave very soon um, to uh, be on a plane to New York, so I'm going to keep this short. Um, so first of all, I think we deal with two sets of issues. On the one hand, illegal content, um, governed to some extent by the e-commerce safe harbor exceptions in Europe and by 230 uh, in the US. And on the other hand, content that is still uh, considered legal, that is disinformation. So two sets of questions here. Um, first, it seems that when the e-commerce directive was enacted, and also the same is true for Section 230, the Internet was a very different place. Not all the big players were present, and the level of personalization that we have today, with all implications that it carries, um, were not at place. So the ever-increased profiling and thus the personalization of user experience leads to uh, editorial responsibility. So I guess that begs the question, um, has the time come for a change on both sides of the Atlantic in terms of revisiting um, Section 230 and also um, the e-commerce directive? Second, when it comes to content that is considered legal disinformation, the question is what should platforms um, do? Um, do we want them to interfere even more with content um, that they already do? For example, to decide on the ranking uh, of news feed um, or make uh, recommendations to users. So with this, um, I'll give the floor to the panelists and maybe starting with Steve before. Sure, uh, let me just make one observation about uh, the French uh, statute and the issue which goes generally to what we're talking about of the 48 hours. Well, the 48 hours might be much too little time for a judge to, to render um, an appropriate decision. It's a lifetime in terms of how quickly the false news can spread. So one of the advantages of what we're doing is by rating and slapping a label on the source of that false news because they've published other false news or because we track them uh, to being a between URL for something that's published other false news, we get that label on proactively before it goes viral in the first minutes, not uh, the 48 minutes. And my observation about uh, the regulatory uh, framework in the United States as well as apparently uh, Europe. Yes, the internet was different then, but um, at least in the case of the United States, uh, Section 230, um, you know, as uh, the professor explained, was passed in order to give the platforms the freedom to give people the kinds of tools we're talking about, the kinds of tools to assess the reliability to give them the freedom to do that. Instead, it seems that they've used Section 230 basically to say, uh, we don't have to do anything because we're not responsible for anything. Many thanks. Maybe um, some of the other panelists would like to jump in here. Yes. Um, well, with regard to the issue of legal content, I think you, you brilliantly um, made, made a distinction here between content that is clearly illegal and other which is legal. Um, I think we should be extremely careful um, with granting 
responsibility or, or uh, given responsibility to platforms and thereby granting them even uh, without wanting so um, even more power do we really want these you know big platforms to be in a position to decide on what content should be online and which should be not uh, a big part of the discussion with regard to platform also from a pers perspective of competition law is of course about the issue of power that they have with regard to the data they own and the network effects etc now, if we talk about giving them power to decide on what content they should host or not, we're adding on power here. I think the, the um, American approach, and maybe even the Swiss approach as well, um, is way better. Labels, and even more importantly, I think uh, we should think about how to educate people so that they, that they will be able to decide themselves on what kind of sources they can trust or not. This information per se is not a completely new phenomenon. We always had to, and at university, one of the most important things that we have to teach people is, you know, if you write a scientific paper, uh, you will consider sources, but what sources to trust? So they need to be able to distinguish between things that are trustworthy and others which are not. And I think by, you know, um, building up um, detailed regulations, things like the French Act or also the uh, Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz in Germany, there is a risk that we taking away this responsibility for the user, giving them some sort of, you know, belief that everything that they read will be trustworthy, which will never be the case, and that by shifting the responsibility, um, we might end up in a situation where people are even less able to judge what to trust and what not. Thanks. Um, come on next. Yeah. Um, I'd like to quickly follow up on what's been said. Um, I, I agree with your distinction between illegal and legal content, and I think it, it quite answers one of the main issues we have here, which is uh, a conceptual problem. Uh, we don't know how to define fake news. We don't know how to call it disinformation, disinformation, manipulation of information. And I'd like to bring one more that I, that I wrote about in the book chapter. Uh, I, I talk about artificial information because I think we need to shift our focus from the substance of fake news to the procedure of fake news. Um, and I define artificial information as a statements or content that adopt the style or appearance of journalistic production without being subjected to procedures of control or professional standards. Because most of the times, people who are spreading false information online uh, are looking for uh, some credibility. They want to make sure that their content appears as credible to other users. Uh, and if we do that, we understand that uh, some, some uh, initiatives like Stephen Brill's initiative um, uh, labeling, um, coming up with a, a code of conduct, with um, a series of um, um, professional standards, like what the GD GTI is doing. Uh, Reporters Without Borders just created the, a project called the Journalism Trust Initiative uh, with the standard, standardization office in France, and their plan is to come up with some ethical and rigorous uh, professional standards for uh, journalists. And the idea is to, is to um, elaborate a proposal, uh, a directive proposal in, in, the, in the next two years. So I think these are interesting things to, to look at. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is to reduce the effect of uh, fake news or artificial information. And, I, and I'd like to, to put on the table two or three uh, ways to do so. The first one in the, in the French case, in case of, um, of legal action. So in 20, 48 hours, of course, as Stephen Real said, it's, it's too much. It's already too late. But what, what platforms could do is to mention, tag, a content that is being uh, scrutinized, saying that this content is uh, under scrutiny at the moment. Please make sure that uh, you, you are looking at like uh, verified sources. Uh, a second thing is to uh, use some logo um, or to um, come up with an index of reliable sources. So I, here again, I, I join what Stephen Brill is doing. Jen? Yes, thanks. So, um, so just in response to a couple of comments that have already have been made. So, so one, I, platforms are already delegated an incredible amount of rights and responsibility to, ter to determine what is online and what's not online. I think what we ought to be wary of is governmental mandates that direct them to, as to how to make those decisions outside of very limited 
circumstances. Um, and I think that the kinds of initiatives that Steve Brill is talking about with respect to increased transparency are exactly the right approach to this really difficult problem that avoid creating more problems than, than the problems they're trying to resolve. Um, I just did want to note that um, there are, um, there have been some ongoing, some efforts in the United States to mandate certain types of transparency. Um, there's a legislation pending in Congress called the Honest Ads Act, but there is also a similar piece of legislation that was enacted by the Maryland State Legislature, and it was actually struck down on First Amendment grounds, um, on the grounds that the providers, and that one, it swept too broadly, but that it was forcing providers to display content. It had a number of requirements about what had to be displayed in connection with all of the advertising online, including um, who the audience was, the number of views, a range of other um, reporting requirements, and those were actually struck down, at least under the US conception of the First, First Amendment and this court's conception of it as mandating provider speech in a way that, that that undermined their, the provider's own speech rights. So I think the kinds of initiatives that Steve Brill is talking about and some of the other um, efforts that are underway that are more voluntary to encourage transparency are really, um, in my view, the most promising approach in this area. Thanks very much. Uh, Sophie? Um, just, just one clarification. So the ECD is not exactly the same thing as the <coughs> CDA. So it's not based on the assumption that uh, we are going to immunize you be, and you should therefore self-regulate the way you want. There is, an, as I said, there is an acknowledgement that what platforms can do uh, uh, could potentially threaten freedom of expression. Um, so that is, I think, important. And this is also... Uh, in the recommendation of the Council of Europe on intermediary liability, uh, this needs to be taken into account. Regulating platforms to make them more powerful, I think, I think that's, in, that's a mistake. Uh, I'm all for regulating platforms, but to uh, diminish, I guess, their power. And the, the, we should stress the importance of, of procedure. Uh, of course, we, in the internet uh, age, we want to have quick reactions. <clears throat> but we should be looking at uh, what uh, is being done in, in different places. And for example, in Estonia, you can have a takedown in five minutes so, uh, with a judge. So uh, we shouldn't diminish uh, uh, the importance of, of the role of the judge too quickly. Just also to, because I think during the last years, we have had so many possibilities of what to use. So there's a lot of talk, well, let's use people. There are people still in the world, so let's use people to go through the content. Well, uh, we have a lot of examples. Facebook uh, has hired, deletes 66,000 posts every single week with the help of people and automated means. Is that really the solution? I'm, I'm not so sure. Furthermore, Court of Human Rights has said that, well, pre-moderation obligation is definitely an unproportionate uh, measure to be used. Uh, second possibility, and what we have seen a lot in different initiatives from the Commission as well from the EU, is uh, technology. Well, let's use different technological measures. Well, the big question again is technology and context. Technology does not know context and is unable today at least to make a difference. Uh, the other possibility is law. Well, as long as the law is directed towards liability, I think probably not, again, the wisest idea because liability always leads to over-regulation by the person who is subject of the law. So maybe not also a best idea. So I also tend to agree that maybe the only good ideas left are what has been already mentioned here is, one is education, education of the society, of the users to be critical of the information. It will, it will take time because of the amount of information and complexity of how the information is uh, is online, but it will take time, but I think in the end that's the right, uh, right way. And the other possibility, I think what the Council of Europe is also uh, standing behind is, is all kind of aid for the users to try to make difference, whether it's through flagging, whether it's through labels, uh, or whether it's, it's some other means, but regulation through liability is probably not uh, the wisest, uh, wisest uh, way, at least, hasn't proven to be. 
Many thanks. So I hope this has been informative. We've covered a lot of terrain here, and we have um, some time for questions also from the audience. So, hi, I'm Mark Rotenberg with um, EPIC. I actually litigated uh, the Communications Decency Act and debated uh, the Senate sponsor at the time, Senator uh, Exxon, who was very concerned about the widespread availability of speech on the internet that he and others found offensive. I think it's very important to separate uh, two distinct parts of the legal history. One was the judgment that the law violated the First Amendment because there were less restrictive ways to limit uh, access to offensive speech, for example, by filters. That was a critical decision, and we strongly supported it because it favored freedom of expression. The second question concerns 230. And 230 sought to determine what the liability should be for companies on the internet. And here I think it's very important to understand how the architecture of the internet has changed dramatically in 20 years. In the early 1990s, we imagined a, a network where the information was at the endpoints. It was described in one opinion as a network of electronic bookstores, newsstands, and libraries. And there are two cases, Cubby versus CompuServe and Stratton Oakmont, which reached different conclusions as to the liability for these operators at endpoints for the information uh, that they made available to the public. Both cases, by the way, were about defamation. One said you had an obligation to inspect the content on your site. The other said you did not. The uh, Congress adopted uh, an extraordinarily broad immunity provision, which said even if it was brought to your attention that what you were publishing was defamatory, this was the Blumenthal case, the Zarin case, even if you knew it was causing harm, even if you paid someone for the defamatory publication, you were still immune as a publisher for any legal consequence. There's nowhere else that you would find this kind of protection. Even distributors of books who have greater protections than publishers of news would not have such extraordinary uh, protection. Now, I would say at the time, we felt this was a bit of an experiment, and it was an effort to clarify case law because there were two competing views. 20 years later, I think it is a big mistake to understand this as the right standard for intermediary liability. The most obvious reason is that we no longer have these little uh, organizations at the end. Paradoxically, the CDA and 230 have accomplished the opposite goal. They've pushed the immunity, um, the liability to the endpoints and immunized the large platforms, which is also why you see the collapse of journalism. Now, I think it's absolutely appropriate to rethink at this point uh, Section 230. As I said, I was there at the beginning. I know what the intent was. I think it was reasonable at the moment to continue to argue that this is the right approach to the internet where the platforms actually extract the commercial value of the information that flows across the internet, I think is doing extraordinary damage. And it was not the intent. Great. That's a great comment, and I think really helps the debate as well. We have many more uh, questions, but I'll take just three more. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Luca Belli, professor of internal governance and regulation at FGV Law School in Rio de Janeiro. I enjoyed very much the conversation, but I had the feeling that it was a little bit a conversation for developing world, meaning that uh, it, it is very interesting to see how all platforms, uh, labeled platforms, not only making a distinction between dominant platform and new entrants are going to be regulated or should be regulated, but I think what one should uh, keep in mind is that six and a half billion people in the world do not have access to all platform, all internet. Uh, actually, in more than 100 countries in the world, uh, particularly people have access to Facebook and the Facebook group applications that are given for free. Uh, let me give you an exa a concrete example. In Brazil, 73% uh, of internet users 
uh, use prepaid uh, mobile uh, internet access where only Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp are given for free, or they are subsidized, and the other are, they have to pay for. So actually, uh, there is a de facto delegation to three platforms, three dominant platforms, to how to handle information or misinformation for the majority of internet users, which are also the majority of voters. So uh, no surprise if they get manipulated before elections. And I think the Brazilian elections, I don't want to enter into the merit of the who has won, who has lost, but they should be a wake-up call for everyone in the world. In Africa, there are 16 countries held, held in election in uh, 2019. Almost no one of them has data protection legislation. So I think if we want to have an overall conversation, we should also consider the 6.5 billion people that are not living in Europe or in the United States. And also, we should also consider that if we want to impose uh, technology or regulation or Google, Facebook, or whatever, whatever other dominant platform, there are not more than 10, uh, we will end up having only those platforms because the new entrants, specifically in the uh, uh, developing world, will never have the possibility to, uh, to uh, comply with these technological or regulatory obligations. So I, I, building up on the previous comment, I think we should make a distinction between what, are, what is the proper regulation of the dominant platform and what are the others, the new entrants, that obviously cannot uh, bear the same kind of regulatory and technological burden. Great. Thanks so much for this comment. I think it gives us an idea for a conference and maybe a second volume of the book. Um, so um, I'm, what I'm going to do, because we have a limited amount of time, is I'm going to take the last two uh, questions slash comments, and then I'm going to give uh, the floor to the speakers for final remarks. Hello, I'm Stergius from Neub. I really appreciated the presentation for the liability in the European Union context. Do, to my understanding, the salvation of Article 15 is GDPR. Is that what I got? Well, it's uh, respectfully, it's, uh, for me, it's wrong, a wrong approach. Simply because, first, for many reasons, but the most important ones is, number one, it's different context. Or the one is commercial, the other is administrative, and it's dangerous to lean and rely on the data protection framework in order to, to save Article 15, number one. Number two, number two is the, no, the novelty of the GDPR, which many people tend to not pay attention to. The material scope, Article 2, Paragraph 4, uh, states, uh, if I remember correctly the quote, without prejudice to Article 12 to 15. In general, there is an issue there, especially for liability. So we can't, for example, change the value gap because of the GDPR. It's, it's a different liability regime. We need something extra. And that's why I would like your two cents on that. So can we say that the critical factor is the passive uh, conduct of the platform operator in order to render him uh, unliable. So my question is, can we say that the secondary activity of the platform operator, which is the primary activities, the service it provides, for example, uh, YouTube provides a service, a video sharing service. The secondary liability, which is the collection of data and profiting out of this uh, activity, can render them active and so not be able to uh, enjoy the liability exemption. Thank you. Thanks. Very short uh, question. We have the last one. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Adil Briand. I work for a program uh, in education uh, with kids to educate them about misinformation, disinformation. And we're going to schools with journalists. And uh, I like the fact that we, we, the, pro the topic of education was brought up uh, and because we've noticed that the platforms are already taking a lot of responsibilities um, uh, by funding lots of projects, educating uh, be it kids or journalists about the topic. And so we were asking, uh, internally we we're discussing this about how, to what extent do we want to outsource this kind of very uh, important topic for our democracy to the private sector with uh, maybe other interests than the, the, the general interest, and also about the tagging and transparency topic. I wanted to say, uh, how do we, how can we somehow um, think about regulation uh, when we think about this case uh, that was recent with who, the plugin Who Targets Me uh, that was uh, blocked by Facebook uh, 
and uh, the same with ProRepublica. So how do we make sure that, th so those are plugins that um, um, uh, make sure that the users are aware of their profiling. And this was blocked, so I'm, I'm thinking, how do we make sure that we can avoid this without regulation or with regulation? Thanks very Thank much. So I want to give the chance to the speakers for final remarks and uh, answers. Um, John. Great, so I just want to respond um, briefly to, to Mark. Um, I, I certainly agree with everything that Mark said. Um, I was trying to describe the, the way in which CDA 230 really is a kind of holy grail in, um, for a lot, of, um, the a lot of different communities in the United States and the difficulties of changing it. Um, but I also agree that it's time to think about reforms and, um, and reconsider aspects of it. That said, I think there's a couple of um, questions about how to do so and that one needs to tread quite carefully so as to avoid incentivizing um, risk-averse providers from excessively taking down material as a means of avoiding civil liability. Um, and then there's a very separate question that we were also talking about, which is government-mandated takedowns. And that's something that first of all, is just um, kind of off the table in most areas in the in US law because of the First Amendment, but I also think it's something that ought to be normatively resisted outside of the First Amendment in most cases, outside, outside of the United States in most cases as well. Great, thanks. Um, just two quick points. Um, they have both been mentioned to some extent. Um, I think one important phenomenon and, and a very problematic one that we're facing right now is um, the loss of income of traditional media outlets. They used to be, you know, the ones that we relied upon with regard to quality and financing good quality journalism tends to be almost impossible all over the world, especially though in smaller countries such as Switzerland. So we see many newspapers dying. And one of the primary reasons is that a lot of the advertising budget is actually going to the big platforms. So we need to think about modules how to find other sources for financing quality media, and that could be it could have a very important impact, I think, on the discussion of disinformation because there would be sources that we could actually rely on. Second point um, with regard to, and thank you very much, Luca, for bringing it up um, with regard to the problem of, of these zero-cost regimes. Um, in, in, in mobile communication um, that could be tackled from a competition law perspective and that has actually, as most of you will know, been addressed also in the European Union, that you would not allow a telco provider to um, offer regimes to customers where they would have access for free to some content and access to other content only if they pay for, because that of course causes a very important disbalance um, economically and gives some of the competitors a, a big advantage because people will use the, the content which is for free. This is not just a disinformation issue that comes on top of it, but also purely competition law issue. And I think that should, the way how to, uh, should be the way that we should you know, apply to try to tackle the problem. I will quickly follow up on the antitrust uh, question. Um, in the French context, a, a presidential decree will establish um, a threshold, which create a threshold um, of monthly connections under which um, small companies will not have to comply with the statute. And I think that this is a, a good way to, to, to find a balance between small actors and, and big platforms. Um, I also would like to, to follow up on, on what Mark Rottenberg was saying about the responsibility uh, uh, of online platforms. We need to think about it seriously. Uh, when I look at the sanctions provided in the French statute, um, if platforms do not comply with the, do not comply with the statute, they they only face seventy five thousand euros fine. But that's nothing. That's nothing in comparison with the millions and the billions of, of dollars they make by just making sure that they can sell data and they can sell uh, advertising space to people around the world who just want to um, uh, contest or. Uh, compete with our democratic institutions. Um, on, the question of, on the question of education systems and, and how we should coordinate the effort by public actors and the private sector and, and the media, uh, I think there's something, there's a recent poll in France that showed the, the, the critical situation we, are, we, we face today. Uh, so the recent poll showed that 69% of French people think that journalists are not independent. Uh, that is, that is to, to, to be taken into account. Uh, the government just um, started to um, 
think about uh, creating an ethics committee for the press. President Emmanuel Macron keeps saying, keep having statements which are badly received uh, from journalists, saying that journalists are no longer searching for the truth. All of these things are creating a kind of hostile environment for the press. Um, and, and we should be worried about privatizing the education system uh, to, to online platforms, because their interest is certainly not to, uh, to make sure that kids and the general public gets better information, this is also, from a strategical perspective, they also try to make sure that they, they're showing their good faith, they're distracting us from the, the, the fundamental question of, of liability. And we need to, to find ways to make sure that our sanctions are, are strong, are dissuasive, and are efficient. Perfect, I think these are um, nice closing remarks also, the aspirations that we have uh, left um, at the end of the panel. So um, thank you very much for uh, coming to all, and uh, I hope that you can join me for a round of applause uh, for our excellent speakers. Thank you.